Hello, everyone. Good evening. We are uh, delighted to welcome you to our pre-Passover evening of, of learning. Uh, excited to have you here and excited to see all these uh, all these faces on the screen. You know, there are many different ways of doing of doing Zooms nowadays, and, and often we do kind of a, a webinar or a frontal presentation, but we thought it was important this evening to have an old fashioned Zoom meeting so we could all see each other and we can all connect together as a, uh, as a community. Uh, Passover is of course the holiday of freedom, but on the flip side, it's also, it's also the, fles the festival of, of hard work. In fact, uh, in fact, my wife and I'm sure others have, has an apron that says it's an ironic apron that she wears to the Seder every year. And it says on it, the words Avadim Hayinu, which means we were slaves, we were slaves. That's the emphasis. And part of the humor in that is how hard, how hard people work for, uh, for the Seder, how hard people work for Passover. And Passover, is, you know, every holiday is a holiday of preparation, but Passover is the great holiday of preparation because it combines both the spiritual preparation that people will do for every other holiday, but also there's very intense physical preparation to create, to change our physical spaces and to refine them and to make sure that we've cleaned not only our souls and our spirits, but our homes, our kitchens, our offices, every area that food enters has to be cleaned for for. Passover. And so part of that preparation is coming together on an evening like this for some, uh, some study and some conversation. And we are delighted that you've joined us. The order for this evening will be uh, Yassi uh, Evenchen, our a ritual director at Shara Shemayim, will be presenting on the topic of a Passover checklist. I will be presenting uh, Pearls of Wisdom, the new Passover Haggadot. And Rabbi Rachel Kol Feingold will speak about redemption and gratitude at the Seder. It's our ambition to, uh, to fit all of this together in about 45 minutes or so. And I also uh, want to uh, wish or send our wishes for Rifuash Lema to our cantor, Gideon Zellermeyer, who's under the weather and unable to join us this evening, but uh, sending him Rifuash Lema, and I know we'll be hearing from him on Yantiv and, and learning from him and being inspired by his, uh, by his tefillot, by his prayers. But unfortunately, he won't be here with us uh, this evening. And so it's my great pleasure to turn the Zoom screen over a dear friend and colleague, Yassi Evenchen, Passover checklist. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Does everybody see, uh, does everybody have the Passover checklist, the big mutts on your screen. Beautiful. So I, I figured, you know, what better way to start off preparation for Pesach if you haven't yet done so uh, by having a quick list that you can really refer to. And perhaps this can aid not only in preparation, but actually as well getting a timely um, a start on your Seder. So without further ado, I want to share the following, which I broke, by the way, up into two different categories. Some of it is the food preparation specific to Pesach. So I'm sorry, but I will not include um, a particular menu for you. That is up to you. But the foods, the ceremonial foods that you have to, um, or traditionally that we share around the table, that is what I want you to have. So your menu is your responsibility. And I'm sure it's going to be delicious. And if you have some leftovers, I would love to try it. So let's move into the first group. The first group is what I call ritual food and drinks. And what you really need is to really understand that there's some, and depending on the size of your Seder as well, you, you always have to, I guess, if you wanna say over uh, uh, buy, not by much, but you wanna, you, you rather not be short at the end, especially when it comes to the ceremonial foods as part of these is what you're ritually um, supposed to, uh, uh, to, 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 to do in order for you to be yotze, in order for you to fulfill your obligation at the Seder. So the first thing, of course, is kosher for Passover wine or grape juice. Make sure you have enough bottles. Don't undercount. The last thing you want to do is, you know, start giving people uh, a one little quarter cup. You want to make sure that you have enough. And you never know, you may have more guests than you anticipate. So an extra bottle of wine, an extra bottle of grape juice uh, is always great on hand as well. Don't forget, you can also use them throughout the year also, so they don't spoil after uh, Pesach as well. Now, matzah is a very interesting um, uh, thing. Of course, we need matzah, 
And I want to speak about a matzah a, a little bit in greater detail because there are many different matzah. If you go right now to IGA, there's chocolate matzah, there's enriched matzah, um, there, there, there is egg matzah, et cetera. The only matzah that you can use for your Seder to be to fulfill your obligation is one with water and flour and setu. That's it. That's the one that, um, and yeast, that, and yeast, that's it. That's, that's the only one that you can use. You cannot use anything that is changed, whether it's added, if an egg has been added to it, um, if, if a juices has been added to it, if it's a chocolate covered matzah, whatever it might be, those are not good for your Seder. So make sure that you have the plain, plain matzah. And again, there's different categories as well. You have shmura matzah, which is uh, a bit more expensive where the, the, the flour has been guarded in a particular manner. Um, and there are also two different categories of shmura matzah. There is machine made and handmade. Handmade is very expensive, roughly, I think anywhere between 25 or $20 a pound and up. So, uh, but it is also considered a hidur mitzvah. It is making beautifying the mitzvah. You're doing well beyond what you have to do. The next thing is the maror. And now maror is what we use as the, the hot um, uh, root that is either chopped up into pieces. Some, some have uh, make it basically almost like, like a, a couple of matchsticks, the size of them about matchsticks. And then others as well grind them to make a little uh, that we can use later on uh, for the sandwich or both, depending on what you want, but make sure that you have enough, but it, and, and uh, also make sure you're, you don't buy too early where it starts going bad and it becomes almost like a sponge and really you can't use it anymore. So that is your maror. The next is the shank bone. The shank bone, of course, these are most of these, by the way, are also things that we're going to be putting onto your Seder plate. That's going to be shortly in another area. The shank bone is what we need. We need the shank bone. And I have a little tip for you that all those that um, are observing a vegan uh, or a meat-free um, uh, Seder, which is a little bit challenging on, on Pesach, but if, if that is your, your, your tradition, that's what you're, you know, you, you do it. Some people actually add or change the shank bone and replace it with beets. So I guess the, the blood, uh, the red, and as well, the word beet uh, should, should, should conjure up some kind of Passover connection. Next is greens. The greens, which we use again, not only on the Seder plate, but it is also customarily eaten at different times during the Seder, is parsley, celery, or other greens if you have other traditions, but make sure you purchase them, make sure they're ready to go, and make sure that they are washed and ready to be placed before the Seder starts. One of uh, perhaps the, the, the defining uh, foods is called the haroset. Haroset is the mixture um, that reminds us uh, of, of the mortar that was used uh, uh, in, in, in the brick lane. It also perhaps reminds us of the working conditions that were dirty, muddy, um, and, and it's, it, it's, it's a brown, uh, thick, Type of mixture, and there are many different uh, varieties of, of haroset. Um, there are haroset that use, uh, as these ones, apples, nuts, almonds. Uh, there are some that use cinnamon, raisin, sweet red wine. I forgot to put up their dates and silan as well. Uh, silan is, is the syrup that comes from the dates. And you may have other things that you add as well, but make sure that um, you make this and make enough of it before your Seder. By the way, you may also want to make some nut-free haroset just in case you happen to have a guest that uh, never told you that he or she may be nut-free. You can make the first batch before you add the nuts into your haroset. Put a little bit aside. Again, um, later on, you can always have it there. It's absolutely delicious. It's the, uh, it's the Passover jam, I guess you can say. It's, a, it's absolutely delicious. Then there are potatoes. Some have the custom of eating boiled potatoes on Passover. Uh, and again, we dip this in salt water, which we're gonna get to uh, number nine, and as well, eggs. And eggs, we need enough of them now uh, to make sure that goes around. What I would suggest is do not get the extra large eggs. This is the perfect opportunity why we have the small eggs. So this is a perfect opportunity to buy as many as you need or a little bit more, but go for the smaller eggs don't you don't this time you don't have to go for your large extra large eggs that the hens have worked extra hard on laying so make it easy for the hen get a small egg for this purpose and last but not least we have the salt and salt water 
I would suggest that you pre-mix in a container, properly labeled, because the last thing you want is you want you do not want to go into your refrigerator or you want to serve water and by mistake pour everybody some salty water uh, during the meal. So make sure you remember which container you're putting this <laughs> water in. And then later on, um, uh, you, you can either do it individually. Some people put it put individually for each one of the participants or in the middle, however you do it, but make sure that you have enough uh, the last thing you want to do is forgetting to make this salt water concoction and run your Seder um, uh, late. Any any questions? Did I miss anything? Do you think any, everything's okay? I think I covered every, everything in terms of the ritual foods and drinks. As I mentioned, the 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 menu is up to you. Make sure don't forget the tzimis. Don't forget don't forget whatever you traditionally serve. But the menu is yours. Your chicken soup. Your and don't forget as well your um, matzah ball, of course. The next is what I call the prep for the seder. This is actually on the night of the seder. And I see a lot of times, and I'm I'm guilty as well, and and perhaps I'm going to use this um, uh, uh, this checklist to make sure that I don't wait last minute. Uh, but there's a lot of little details here that we wait too late, and then what ends up happening is we prolong the seder, or 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 we start, and people are going and getting certain items, and they're not with everybody, etc. So in order to make sure that we start on a timely manner, if you prepare these beforehand, uh, it should help you. Number one is candles and candlesticks, of course. Um, to, to light the, the candles for the Chag. It happens to be as well Shabbat this year. Um, uh, so make sure that you have enough candles, you have candlesticks. Uh, don't forget as well to remember which days we say Shechianu and which days we do not say Shechianu, um, but that it is all in your Haggadot. Number two is, I did forget something, you see? I know I did forget something. Looked, with pillows should have been chairs chairs and pillows. Um, quite often we forget or we miscount uh, the number of guests and then we run around because they're, they're, the numbers are much larger than we usually um, have of guests and we're short on chairs. So make sure that you gather up enough, enough chairs, ask your friends uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're getting it from somewhere, make sure you also get a couple of extras because sometimes as I mentioned, you end up having more guests than you anticipate. And the last thing you want is to have to push the couch beside the, the, um, the table. So you have enough chairs for everybody plus extras. And the pillows as well, collect them before the Seder. Put them somewhere. If you don't want to put them at the table, put them somewhere nearby that you can just go and grab them. And of course, we use this to lean on the left-hand side. The pillows are a sign of nobility, a sign of comfort, a sign that we are free. The Haggadot, perhaps the most important of all these, is uh, what type of Haggadot do you want to choose? There's two uh, ways of looking at it. You can, if if you have a Seder where you share readings, um, where you want, where where maybe people will will get lost, they don't know the entire Seder that well. Perhaps uniform Haggadot are the best, where you can, you know, burn out the, the the page number and everybody will be on that page, as opposed to trying to figure out. What page am I? Is this before that picture? Am I before Dayenu? Am I after Dayenu? I don't know where I am. And so keep the same Haggadot. If, on the other hand, you are sufficiently well-versed in the order of the Haggadot, having different Haggadot enriches the Seder because you'll, there'll, there'll be explanations. Um, there, might, there might be other uh, um, ideas uh, that pop up depending on which Haggadot you have. And different participants can also share different viewpoints that they receive from the Haggadot. So again, this is up to you, but make sure that you have enough of them and that they are pulled out before the Seder. So don't, do not go into your cupboard during or right before you start the Seder to pull your Haggadot out because you may be short or, or you may have you know, forgot that they're not there anymore. You moved them last year to a better place, but you don't remember which place it is. So make sure you know where your Haggadot are and they are out. Number four is your Seder plate. Prepare this before the Seder. Um, if you are of Iraqi origin or, or, or Iranian origin, some, they don't even have a Seder plate. They actually put the different items on, on the scattered along the table. It's kind of interesting, but if that is not uh, your, your custom, make sure that your Seder plate is ready before the Seder. Uh, for those that have a matzah holder, um, and this might also enable you to have enough uh, to make space on your, on your table, as, of course, the Seder table gets quite, quite, quite um, uh, busy. 
Uh, if you have a matzah holder that sits underneath the seder plate or combined with the seder plate, that might be helpful, but make sure you know where it is and you're not running in the last minute to try to find it. The cups of wine, wine glasses, and as well, glasses just to drink, regular glasses, and extra place settings, make sure that you have them all out. And if you need any extra, if you have kids that are coming, uh, grandchildren, and you may not use your, your the finest of chinas for, for them, make sure that you bought enough uh, paper plates and cups, et cetera, for them, um, and that you don't have to scrounge around and, 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 and look for, for, for that, those, uh, those items. Don't forget also in, in your count for wine glasses, if your tradition is to have, uh, well, we have a, the cup for Elijah, of course, but if you, you have the tradition of including the cup for Miriam, make sure you have that in the count as well. You don't want to run afterwards and uh, look for it. In many houses, they have a specific cup just for those two, for one for Elijah, who symbolizes the Messianic year, and Miriam, in order to thank, she saved Moses and to thank her for all, um, for, for the water, which we were sustained with during the uh, sojourn in the desert. As well, one of the first things that we do on in the Seder is the, the um, leader washes uh, his or her hands. And so if you have a pitcher with a cup ready and a dish towel ready for your that leader to already wash his or her hands, then you don't have to run around, find, bring, fill, not dry. It's right there. It helps the Seder move especially it's only one person doing it. Um, this way, that person is not prolonging and making everybody else wait. And sometimes when, when, when that occurs, chit chat starts coming and, and it's very hard to get everybody back in order. So that will help make the uh, Seder flow. Um, an afikoman bag, uh, rather than trying to find uh, uh, where, you know, what should I put it in? If you don't have a bag, you can use a Ziploc, you can use a napkin, um, you can use uh, uh, any, any closer. Some people even use a pillow uh, case. Um, but what I would suggest, along with the holder and a bag, try to think of a hiding place before the Seder. So that way you can get the kids going on early, especially now that with, with, with the Seder beginning late at night, think of a place where you want to hide it as opposed to holding them up and say, I haven't figured out a place. I don't, I don't know where I'm going to hide it. Have your bag ready, put your afikoman in there and be prepared to hide that afikoman and get the, the, the kinderlach um, uh, all excited about that. And finally as well, um, for those, some traditions have it that, you know, it, 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 uh, it's a family tradition to go out and, and buy the afikoman prizes after Pesach or during Pesach as, as the reward for finding and for participating in the Seder. If you want to give instant gratification, um, then don't forget to as well uh, purchase the afikoman prizes uh, in advance. Uh, and, and that really goes through the entire list. Um, this, by the way, for you is the Seder plate. So if you're, you, I would highly suggest every year we forget the order perhaps, or we don't remember what things are go on it. Print yourself up a little, a little, or open your, your Haggadah as you're doing it. Go through it. Make sure you have all the items that are on your Seder plate. Now, I believe that this is what the checklist looks like. And again, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but with the pillows should be chairs. Um, and I believe this will be available. So if you, if you feel that this checklist will be helpful for you, um, then please uh, just let us know at the end of this uh, night. And I think it's also gonna be um, sent out in, in, in the mailings. It will be available for you to print out. And I hope that it's, it'll be helpful to you and that it enables you to uh, not only prepare properly, but make your Seder that much smoother. And with that, I wanna wish everybody Chag Kasher Vesameach, as we say, you get the matzah, don't let the matzah get you. Thank you so much, Yossi, uh, for that beautiful presentation. Uh, we're going to unshare your screen, if you don't mind, if you can do that, Yossi. Okay, fantastic. We're on to, uh, we're on to part two and on to a tour of new Haggadot. And this is one of my favorite uh, sessions to prepare for all year. Um, it combines some good old fashioned Sepharim shopping, going shopping for some new, some new books and, prepare, and preparation for, uh, for Passover. And, uh, and it's really luck of the draw because some years are, are strong years in terms of new Haggadahs and other years are a bit 
lagging lagging behind. This year, I would say, was a, a moderate year in terms of new Haggadot. I think part of that has to do with our shopping patterns from last year, and a lot of people hadn't picked up the new Haggadot from last year because we still weren't rushing into the stores and the shops uh, last year. But we're going to take a look at some of the new Haggadot from, uh, from this year. One of those, and uh, I'm going to share in the chat also, I will share uh, this particular, the sources that I'm going to share with you right now on the screen are also available uh, on our webpage. And I just put that link in there as well. I'm going to share a gift uh, with all of you that we've shared in years past. And that about five years ago, my uh, friend and colleague, Richard Marceau and I put out a Haggadah called the Canadian Haggadah Canadienne, uh, a, uh, a success, a bestseller, to the point where we really don't have any more to sell. They're, they really don't, don't exist. I don't know if there's a secondary market or there's a markup that you can put it on eBay and, and make a few bucks to, to uh, help compensate for the increased uh, price of Shmura Matzah this year. But either way, uh, we are making it available as well for your perusal and pleasure. And the link also to that Haggadah in its entirety, complimentary, has been put in, in the chat uh, as well. So I'm going to share my screen right now and share uh, share these sources with you as soon as I can find it amongst the 46 windows that are open on my computer. There we go. We're going to begin with the Haggadah of the Ger dynasty. And this was uh, put together by, uh, by Yisrael Besser, otherwise known as Shruli Besser, who's actually a Montrealer. And he put this out through Art Scroll Press. And you can see it says the faith and fire of the Admorim of Pshischa, Kutsk, and Ger. And those are three for those uh, follow Hasidut, fans of Hasidut, students of Hasidut, those names, those three names of those, of those towns, they speak volumes. And it's actually sequential in terms of how the tradition was handed down. Rav Simcha Bunim of Pshischa, we're talking about uh, late 18th, early 19th century. Rab Simcha Bunim of Pshischa's student was Rab Menachem Mendel of Kutsk. Rab Menachem Mendel of Kutsk's student was, was the Chidushe Harim, who was the first Ger Rebbe. And so there's a nonstop lineage that goes, or, or trajectory of, student, of, of master to student, of Rebbe to Talmud, that goes from Pshischa to Kutsk to Ger. And when we talk about the Ger dynasty, they are all, of course, uh, greats, gedolim, and two really stand out amongst the history of Hasidus. The first Ger Rebbe is known as the Chidushe Harim. Rav Yitzchak Mordechai was the altar, being the last name, was the Chidushe Harim. And then the third Ger Rebbe is referred to by the name of his book, which is called the Sfas Emes, the Sfat Emet, which is a very often quoted uh, uh, book really an extraordinary work. And so this Haggadah takes little sound bites, little snippets of these teachings of within that great tradition and applies it to, uh, to the Haggadah. And so we're going to look at just two sections from this. The first has to do with Yachatz and some of these, the, the, the pullout sections from the Haggadah I've taken from the Canadian Haggadah. Um, and this just referring just to orient us in terms of where we are on the Haggadah, this is referring to Yachatz, to the part of the Haggadah, where we take the middle matzah and we break it into two pieces, right? And, and of course, we all try to break it into two even pieces. We all fail miserably as we try to break it into two even pieces because one is inevitably, it's physically impossible, I think, uh, to, uh, to break a matzah into exactly two even pieces. And therefore, we take the larger piece and we put it away as the afikomen, and we use the smaller piece as part of the rituals of the magid and part of the hamotzi and, 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 and so on, and the, and the motzi matzah, we use the smaller of the middle pieces. And there's a lot to be said about this ritual. There are so many comments about why, what the three matzot symbolize. Kohen, Levi, Yisrael is one, uh, is one example. Another example is that it refers to, uh, to the middle, the middle refers amongst, in the siblings at least, refers to Moshe representing the, the, the Levi in that. Um, there's a lot to be said about it. There's one opinion that says that it refers to the Bechor. One, refer, one uh, is the Bechorot, or the firstborns or the top. They were, they were the leaders at the time of the Exodus. The middle one referred to the tribe of Levi, and the bottom one refers to 
all of Israel. There's a lot to be said about the symbolism of the three matzot and why we break the, the middle matzah. Let's take a look at what this Haggadah, the Ger Haggadah, says about that middle matzah. And it's important to think about when we eat this matzah. One piece, the smaller of the middle piece, again, is eaten during the Haggadah, during the Seder. And the last one is eaten at the end of the Seder. What does the end of the Seder symbolize? L'shana haba'a b'Yerushalayim. That's the moment of redemption. So the smaller piece is at the time of remembering our historical freedom, and the larger piece is about our future freedom. And that's what the Ger Rebbe says, and that's what he says. Firstly, the Kutzke Rebbe would tell his Hasidim that a Yid, that a Jew, has to toil and labor over the stories of Gullus Mitzrayim, of the exile to Egypt, and Yetzias Mitzrayim, and leaving Egypt freedom from Egypt, like they do over a difficult Tosfos, Tosfos being the commentators on the, on, on the Talmud, things that they, they break the mind. You have to really get deep and you have to toil over it and you have to struggle over it. And the Kutzke Rebbe said that you have to approach the Haggadah the same way you would, you would over a difficult portion of the Talmud. You have to wrestle with it since within them lie the seeds of every subsequent exile and redemption. This isn't a historical book. This is a book that gives us tools for the future. Therefore, says the Svas Enes, the third Ger Rebbe, both pieces come from the same matzah, because the process of redemption is one. The final geula is connected to the first one, as we say in davening, behold, I have redeemed you in later times, kime olam uchshanim kadmoniot, and like earlier times as well. And then he quotes the Talmud, and the Talmud says, what's going to happen when the Mashiach comes? What are we going to, what are, what are our historical events? What are our celebrations? What are our holidays going to look like? And the Talmud says that when the Mashiach comes, what's going to happen to Pesach? So Ben Zoma said to the Chachamim, will we mention Yetziah Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt in the Messianic era? Will that be relevant after the redemption? But has it not already been said, and he quotes the prophet Jeremiah, which says that no one, people will no longer say, God, who brought the children of Israel up from the land of Egypt, we're not going to, going to refer to God as the one who brought us out of Egypt but we're going to refer to God as what? As the one who has brought the Messiah, as the one who has, who has gathered in the exiles. God's going to do something greater than Egypt. So we're no longer to refer to God in the context of Egypt. And the Talmud he quick, continues, answers that these verses don't teach us that the, the, the story of Egypt is going to be completely erased, uprooted from its place. Rather, the mentioning of the redemption of the dominion of foreign kingdoms will be primary, and the mentioning of the exodus of Egypt will be secondary to it. It's not that Egypt is going to be forgotten. It's just that it's going to be contextualized. It's going to be subjective. It's going to be relative. When the Messiah comes, we're still going to remember that God took us out of Egypt, but it won't be as important because something greater will happen. He said, therefore, says the Ger Rebbe Shlita, the current Ger Rebbe Rishol Alter, this is why the smaller piece is used to acknowledge the story of the Exodus to Egypt. And the bigger piece is saved for the end of the Seder when we talk about the future redemption. Because when you compare the two together, the Exodus from Egypt is the smaller of the stories, is the less significant of those two stories. I think that's a beautiful insight. That's why we break the middle thoughts into two pieces, because there are two redemptions, one in our history, one in our future. The bigger piece, that's the one for the future. That's the one for the end of the Seder. That's the one for the Shana Habab Yerushalayim, the smaller piece. That's the story of coming out of Egypt, because comparing the two, that will be the smaller of the two miracles. That's one approach of the Ger, of the Ger Rebbe, which I loved. I love this, uh, I love this teaching. I thought it was a beautiful teaching. One more from this Haggadah, while we're on a roll. V'hi <laughs> she'amda, this is what stood, this is a powerful moment in the Haggadah where we lift, we, we raise our cups. Some have the custom at this point of covering the matzah and saying these powerful words. This is what have stood for our ancestors, for us in good stead. For not only has one enemy stood over us to annihilate us, but every generation. Yet the Holy One keeps the promise to save us from their hands. Powerful. Every generation, they come for us. 
and in every generation, God protects us. That, those are the words of the Haggadah. And the focus that we're going to look at are these words in Hebrew, Shelo echad bilvad. Not only has one enemy stood over us. That's how it's translated. Not only has one enemy stood over us. So look at what this Haggadah says. The reason that our enemies could not overtake us, says the Svas Emes, the third Ger Rebbe, is because our enemies were never only one. They were never unified as one, with no competing agendas. Even when they joined forces against us, it was not with the unity necessary to triumph. They are not capable of unity, and thus they have never succeeded. To put this in more contemporary term, ter terms, it's been said in, in many different ways by many different people that anti-Semitism and that hatred against Jews is the one form of hatred that can come from any direction. That when a Jew is stricken, is struck, God forbid, the Jew has to look in both directions to see which side it came from. Was it the right? Was it the right wing? Was it the left? Was it the left wing? Because both have segments of anti-Semitic anti approaches of Jew hatred. This is, of course, part of the complexity of being a Jew. This is very frustrating. But at the same time, the Svas Emes is saying there's a piece of, oh, there's a blessing to this as well. Because if everybody got along, if they were unified in their mission and in their vision, then that would be a much more difficult situation. The fact that they're splintered, that they share a commonality of anti Semitism, but not a common cause and not common objective. That, that that's part of that's part of the blessing. That's part of what makes it what makes it easier for us to combat. They are not capable of unity, he says, and thus they have never succeeded. And that's how he interprets the words: for not only one has risen against us to annihilate us, not only one cause, he means, not only one approach, but many different approaches have risen against us, and that makes it a little bit easier for us. So that's the first Haggadah, we're only through one Haggadah so far, so we're going to pick up the pace a little bit because, uh, because our time together is limited, but I want to show you some of the beauty of the new Haggadot, and those are just, you know, two examples of, of hundreds and hundreds of this, uh, of this new, uh, new Haggadah. There's a beautiful new Haggadah. This is my favorite from the year. It's called Belahavat Esh, in the heart of the fire. Belibat Esh, I'm sorry, in the heart of the fire. It's by Rav Moshe Weinberger, who is the Rav in Woodmere, Congregation Esh Torah. He's affiliated with Yeshiva University as well. I encourage you, just look up this Rav. Look at some of his, his lectures online. He is an extraordinary teacher and a very unique figure in, uh, in, in the world of spirituality, of modern Orthodox spirituality, of Hasidic spirituality. There's a lot to be said there. This is a new Haggadah. And with this new Haggadah in the, in the uh, opening essay, the editors apologize. And they basically say, look, we know what Haggadahs are supposed to be. They're supposed to be short vortlach, short little segments, short little insightful quotes. You know, give me bite-sized quotes. Rav Moshe Weinberg, doesn't, his thought doesn't lend itself to bite-sized quotes. So they're more mini essays on the Haggadah, but some of them are quite powerful and, uh, and beautiful. And one example has to do with karpas. Right, you know how we, we wash our hands and then we say that we do orchats, you wash your hands without the blessing, and then we eat karpas, we eat the vegetable, right? It can be celery, can be potato, it can be vegetable, depending on our custom. And, uh, and the question is why? What's the meaning of this ritual? A lot to say about this. So look at what Ramosha Weinberger says, which I thought was great. And he says, karpas, usually when you wash your hands, kind of the, <laughs> the, the Pavlovian. Jewish response to washing your hands is to eat challah. You, you get hungry, you start to, 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 to desire the challah, but here you only have a little piece of vegetable. So what, what, what happens? What's the, the lesson? The lesson is to be happy with less. That's it. You wash, you expect challah, you get vegetables, and that's okay. As human beings, he says, we focus on the end result of our efforts the end and destination, not just the means of the journey. We judge our personal, personal success by our ability to actualize our desires. I'm going to skip a little bit. You can look at this in our own time. Our job is to train ourselves to enjoy and celebrate small, simple, and humble achievements, whether spiritual or physical. We equip ourselves with agility, with the ability to pivot quickly from a focus on the highest ambitions 
to satisfaction with the simplest accomplishments. Eating a little carpas the, at the Seder trains us to be adaptable. Maybe we wanted to have the perfect wife, husband, or ch children. Maybe we dreamed of a certain career or business success. Maybe we had great goals, but when they don't work out, Hashem calls upon us to celebrate the modest accomplishments, to find satisfaction in a little karpas. As Rebbe Nachman says, a little bit is also good. So this is, I thought, is a beautiful interpretation of karpas. Why do we eat that? Why do we wash our hands and eat the little vegetable? Or Moshe Weinberger says to teach us to be happy with less. You don't always need a delicious challah after washing your hands. Tonight, we're going to wash our hands. God forbid, we'll have challah, we'll have matzah later on. But at the very least, this vegetable, it's a little bit, but it's enough. I thought that was a, a really nice, really nice interpretation. Okay, on to the next Haggadah. The Haggadah for the curious. These are at least three volumes of this. I first encountered it uh, this year. I have it right here in front of me as well. It is, a, it is a new publication, copyright 2022. And this is volume three. And they ask questions. And the challenge with this Haggadah, it's Haggadah for the curious. For me, the challenge here, and I, I, this, is, I, this is not a, a, a critique per se, but they ask questions that nobody would ever ask, meaning it's not a Haggadah which asks questions that are obvious. They're not, uh, at least at least volume three, they're asking questions like, what did the Chafetz Chaim use for Karpas? Which nobody has ever asked me this question, but it's a question nonetheless. So if you're inclined to ask questions like this, then this is the Haggadah for you. What is the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi Yisrael, Meir coin from Rodden? What did he use? Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, the end of 19th, beginning of the 20th century, what did he use for karpas? He used a boiled potato. And then they notes as well that some people don't use things that give people bad breath, like an onion or radish, because our mouths are quite significant on Passover. We're telling the story. So use something that's going to maintain fresh breath for, uh, uh, for this. Okay, so that's one question in the Haggadah for the curious. Another question, two more questions. Do you prefer fake teeth over real teeth? I love this question. Nobody's ever asked this question. I don't know. But anyway, in the Haggadah for the Curious, they're asking this question, what's better, fake teeth or real teeth? And, they, and it's actually quite a significant question because they point out that actually, according to Michal Bear Weismandel, that when we talk, and this, the context here is, of course, the evil child who you blunt his teeth, but that's not as important. The context is not as important. But basically what he says, you know what? Teeth are, are, are so fragile, right? And teeth, you have such care and you can put in fake gold or silver teeth that are much nicer and much more sturdy and stable. Why don't we do that? Because we know you'd never choose to do that because the teeth that God gave you are far superior. In the same way, you should know that our sacred traditions have been handed down through the generations are far better than going with the secular winds of the time, both physically and spiritually. So it's an interesting insight into teeth that offers you an insight into the, into the Russia, into the wicked child. Another interesting question, what happened to the frogs? Talking about all the plagues, what happened to the frogs in the river during the plague of blood, right? We know there are a lot of traditions about the fish. What happened to the, you go from dam to tzvardea, you go from blood to frogs. What happened to the frogs during blood? So the answer is they died. And that made the appearance of frogs so much more miraculous because they were just, they perished in the plague of blood. And now suddenly there are millions and millions of frogs here. So that's part of the miracle, says this Haggadah uh, for the curious. The last Haggadah I wanted to show, uh, we're going to look at a comment that's based on the section of Avadim, Hayinu Lefaro B'Mitzrayim. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God took us out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. And if God had not taken our answer, and the emphasis is that God needed to take us out. It's not that had we not left, we would have been incomplete, but God, the emphasis on the fact that God took, God was the one who took us out. That's part of the focus of the Haggadah, right? Moshe is not mentioned in the Haggadah because the story is about how God took us out. So there's a Haggadah of the Maharal, the Maharal in the 17th century Prague. Why, and he offers a whole number of reasons as to why the emphasis is on God. And the answer he gives, let's say I'm going to skip around a little bit because we're really running short on time. So the analogy, the following analogy, suppose a rabbi, I don't know why a rabbi, but the, the example he gives here is a rabbi 
Suppose a rabbi warns a person of an imminent war in his country. The person leaves, relocates elsewhere, and establishes a family in a new country. The advice helps the family who listened and fled. I thought this was a very relevant analogy for today. The rabbi is credited with saving the people he advised. And while this advice helped indirectly help the grandchildren, you cannot be credited with sending them out of harm's way, right? It was the grandparents he sent out of harm's way, not the grandchildren, but yet it benefited the grandchildren. That's not the case with God. When God saved our ancestors from Egypt, God also saved who? God saved us from Egypt. God gets credit for every generation. That's part of why we're emphasizing that God took us out, because God took us out. Even though God took our ancestors out, God also took us out. Even though, you know, things that happened in the histories of our family, yes, we benefit from them, but not directly necessarily. But here we benefit directly from God having taken our ancestors out of Egypt. That's the approach of the Maharal. And then finally, I think I said the last one was the last Haggadah, but here's one more bonus Haggadah. This is Rav Yaakov Galinsky, who is a Magid, who mixes together teachings and stories. This is a, I love this Haggadah. It is part of a larger uh, set that he has on all the different chumashim, on the different books of, of the Torah and the Parsha, and they put out an edition for the Haggadah. And just one of his teachings has to do with uh, why, we're, why we're emphasizing Paro and being redeemed from Paro. Why is, why are we, what is, what was it about Paro that was uh, the leader of Egypt? Why, what, why, what was his threat to us? And, and so he talks and mentions the Midrash that says that Paro actually wanted to protect the Jews. The Egyptians wanted to persecute, persecute the Jews and Paro refused. They had too much to be grateful to the Jews for and the king, uh, the king admonished. The king said, no, we're grateful to the Jews, a king with ethics. But then according to the Midrash, they overthrew his reign and took away his crown. And three months later he relented and he came back and he said, oh, there's a new king here. So the Midrash says, no, it's the same king. Just this king changed his mind. This king protected the Jews, and then this king was ready to sell the Jews to the people, was ready to give them up. What changed? Politics. The king realized he was about to lose his throne. He was a man of ethics until he was threatened with losing his shtela, with losing his position. This characterized his leadership. He was struck with a plague, and he was about to let the children of Israel go, the plague stopped and he changed his mind, like a weeble toy, knock it down, it pops back up. So it points out this is the character of Paro. He has principles until he no longer has principles. He doesn't have principles and then the principles come back and then they go as the wind blows, so too Paro's opinion, Paro's opinion changes. And this is part of the plague. Are we free of Paro from the fickleness and caprice? That was the lesson he derives from, from Paro. This is the threat of Paro, not to be like Paro, but to have integrity and to have principles. Those are the new Haggadot. Those are just little tidbits, little uh, uh, samples of the new Haggadot. And I want to, uh, to just mention as well and to, to admit that you know, now, of course, as everything in life, there are two realms in which we exist. There's the bookstore and then there's the online realm. And for every Haggadah that one can find in a, in a good Jewish bookstore, you can find 45 equivalent Haggadot online. Rarely of the same quality, but still there's a lot available. There's so much available online, such as the Golden Girls Haggadah, the Woman's Seder, and all kinds of different Haggadot that one, this is just a, a sampling of it, but there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Haggadot that are available for research, for use, to print out before Yantiv, and, uh, and so on. So this was just a whirlwind tour of some of the new Haggadot. Go out to your local Judaica store and purchase some, go online. But that's part of the Passover tradition is that every year there's something new to learn. Every year there's something new to say. Every year there's something new to add to the conversations and the insights that we share around our Passover, our Passover table. Thank you very much. And it is now my great pleasure to turn it over to Rabbi Rachel Kol Feingold for our final segment in this evening's presentation.
Thank you so much, Rabbi. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all. Um, I have the honor of being the last on the Zoom uh, as we near the end of the hour, and I know how hard Zoom can be on the brain, so I just want to encourage everyone to take a stretch or look away from your screen for a few seconds, digest everything we've learned. There's been so much already, and um, maybe even think of something that you're taking with you um, that you'd like to think about some more. I know we'll, we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Um, I'll mention something that I learned which is that uh, the vegetable that the Chafetz Chaim used for karpas was the same vegetable that my grandfather used for karpas, which was a potato. Um, and that makes a lot of sense because they were both from Poland. And when I once asked, you know, why, why does Zaida, my Zaida, use a potato for karpas? The answer was, that's what we had. What do you have in, in Poland, you know, a hundred years ago, you had uh, potatoes, you had potatoes in the winter, you had potatoes in the summer, you had potatoes for breakfast, you had potatoes for dinner, you had a kartoffel, no, that's what he had. Um, what I'd like to do uh, this, this evening is to take a look at what I think is probably the um, least appreciated corner of the Haggadah, and that's for a very particular reason. And I'm not talking about the very end. Somehow we perk up at the end. You know, these are those fun songs that we've been waiting all night to sing. But I'm talking about what comes at the very end of the section of Magid, the, the long section of telling the story of, of the Exodus. And the last thing that we do is we, what do we do at the end of it? We drink the second cup of wine. I don't know about you, but for me, as a kid, I remember always flipping ahead, flipping ahead, flipping it, like how many pages till we drink that second cup? Because I knew after we drank that second cup, we could move on to something to eat, right? We'd get up again, we'd wash our hands, we'd have the matzah and the maror. So what I simply want to look at tonight is the, the blessing that we recite on that second cup of wine. We're going to look at it in the Canadian Haggadah Canadien. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Shire. And um, I'd like to look at it and appreciate what this blessing is about and perhaps how this can reflect on our experience of Passover. Um, and I hope maybe it will invigorate uh, the, the tail end of your Magid section as we're about to drink that second cup. So this is the bracha that we say right before, you can see on the left-hand side of the page, there's a lengthy bracha. And then on the right-hand side, uh, there's the Bore Prihagafen, the, the blessing over the wine or the grape juice. So this is what we say right before we drink that second cup. It starts with the formulaic opening of a, of a blessing. And I'm going to read it here in the Hebrew. You can follow, of course, here in the English as well in the French. Blessed is God, right? Baruch HaTashem Elokeinu Melech HaOlam. Asher ge'alanu ve'ga'alet avoteinu mimitzrayim. God who redeemed uh, us and our forefathers from Egypt. Remember, we're supposed to see as if ourselves, we, we ourselves were there. And, and brought us to this night where we're eating our matzah and maror. And then it moves Cain, and so too, God, God of our forefathers. May you bring us to future celebrations, future holidays. May they bring us May they greet us with peace. Maybe may, may we be joyous in the rebuilding of your city of Jerusalem. And so happy and rejoicing in worshiping you. And then in this time in the future of we'll be eating once again the sacrifices, the paschal sacrifices um, in the uh, in the temple in Jerusalem someday. This sound, sounds like an esoteric detail, but the sprinkling of the blood on the altar was a very significant part of bringing sacrifices. So, so too, we hope to be there someday doing that again. And then we will thank you. Shir Chadash with a new song, Al Ge'ulatenu Al Pedut Nafshenu, for redeeming us, uh, for, for redeeming our souls. And we close this with Aruch Hashem, Blessed are you, God. Ga'al Yisrael, that who, he, he, God who redeemed Israel. So what I want to just uh, do for a moment is, is unpack this blessing, understand what it, where it comes from, and understand what it's trying to do for us. 
And so I'm actually going to switch my share. Give me a moment. And I'm going to share with you uh, a conversation about this blessing by the rabbis of the Mishnah. And there's a debate, of course, there's a debate about the, the formula of this blessing. So they're giving, um, this is the Mishnah in the tractate Psachim. And, and, and this Mishnah, it's, it's, it's 2000 years ago. It's kind of the, the early, one of the earliest places we see any part of the, of the Haggadah discussed. And uh, it says right after we have a little snippet of Hallel, which is where this blessing comes, we had like, not the Hallel that we do at the end, but the first two paragraphs of Hallel. Then we get to this blessing and there's a debate. Rabbi Tarfon says that we should recite God here. I'm just moving it so people can see it in the Hebrew as well. Rabbi Tarfon Omer, that we should say this blessing, Asher ge'alanu ve'ga'alat avotenu mimitzrayim, that you should say this blessing of God who redeemed us and our forefathers from Israel, uh, from Egypt, excuse me. And that's the end of the blessing. Rabbi Akiva says you have to add something. Basically, God also will bring us redemption in the future and ends with this Ga'al Yisrael. So this blessing is actually a blessing in two parts. The first part, you have to go like this when you're learning, right? The first part was the first line or so that Rabbi Tarfon said that was the whole blessing. And the second part is the part that Rabbi Akiva wanted to add. So if we go back and look at our Haggadah, here we are again. You can really see it is in two parts. The first line is about the past. The first two lines here. God who redeemed us from Egypt and brought us to the present. And the second part from the word Cain, in English, it's um, sort of truncated a little bit, but you will bring us in peace to future holidays. So that's about not the past, but about the future. This reminds me of the lesson that uh, the rabbi shared earlier of the Sfat Emet, connecting the matzah of the past to the matzah of the redemption of the future, right? So when we're thinking about Egypt of the past, Rabbi Kiva says, uh, uh, uh. we have to also think about redemption of the future. So the first couple of lines really are about gratitude. Thank you, God, for bringing us out of Egypt. Thank you, God, for bringing me here tonight. Le'echobo matzah umaror. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here eating the same foods that they've been eating for centuries. And, and then um, we switch gears to, to, to thinking about our hope for the future. Um, I, I believe God that there will be more redemption in our future. There will be more reason to celebrate. Interestingly, scholars believe that the beginning part of the blessing probably was something that existed already in the time of the temple where people were already sitting down to seders, of course, in, in addition to bringing the Paschal lamb in the temple, they also sat around and they drank and they, and they rejoiced uh, you know, in gratitude for the Exodus. And so they might've said this blessing, thank you God for redeeming us from Egypt. And that today we're eating matzah umaror. They would have said Pesach matzah umaror because they were eating the Paschal lamb and the matzah and the maror. And at this period is where they would have stopped. And Rabbi Tarford says, that's, that's the blessing we have from the past. That's the blessing we should say today. Rabbi Akiva was the one who said, ah, we have to add a hope for the future. Rabbi Akiva, of course, was involved in the rebellion against Rome and, and um, wanted to make sure that we were always thinking about the next redemption and, and, and the hope for the future. So, so Rabbi Akiva says, we have to also attach our redemption from the past into um, our faith for a better time ahead. And so this latter part of the blessing is all about a future redemption. And so um, I guess I wanna close this uh, by encouraging, first of all, encouraging everyone not to lose too much steam as you're getting to the end of, uh, of the Magid section and you know that second cup is coming, that there's a very beautiful moment here um, and I'll, I'll just, I'm gonna page back so you see where it comes after. It comes after these two paragraphs of the Hallel. There's a Hallel paragraph number one, a Hallel paragraph number two. We save the rest for the end of the Seder, but we're in the middle of praising God after having told that incredible story, right? Dayenu and all of that. We're praising God and we end it with 
with um, gratitude for the past and also for this night and hope for the future. And so first of all, like, don't let's, let's not lose this. Cause I, I know that it's, it's very hard for us at our Seder to, to keep focus when everyone knows they're about to get up and wash. Um, but secondly, I, I just want to suggest maybe a framing that would help um, your Seder guests perhaps stay focused on this. You can ask, you know, part one, as I said, was about gratitude. And part two is about hope for the future. You can ask what is something that you're grateful for, whether from the past or for this day, you know, on this evening, what's something that, that gives you gratitude? Or you can ask the story that helps point to the second part of the blessing, which is about the future. You can ask maybe what story from your past gives you hope for the future? What's something that you have seen before that helps you feel confident that redemptiveness is still coming in the future. Because that's really what this framing does for, for the, the Yitziat Mitzrayim, the story of the Exodus from Egypt, is that it encourages us to then use that as, as fuel for what's gonna come next, for how we can move forward as a Jewish people. If we could get through that, what can we get through next? And that's what we say over that second cup of wine. And then Lechayim, we drink up. So I'm going to stop there and I hope that uh, maybe your Seder will stay uh, focused on that second cup and not let it get, get washed away um, in the Magid uh, as I know it's likely to do. Um, are, we, are we taking some questions maybe in the chat? Or... Yeah, if, if anybody has, uh, has questions, we, we have a few, a few minutes. Uh, if anybody wants to bring up any questions or issues, that's what we're here for. And otherwise, we'll just enjoy having been together for this hour. I'd love it if nobody has questions. Even you can put a comment in the chat of one idea or one, one thing that you're, th that you're really reflecting on. I know sometimes it takes time for people to think of their questions, but uh, you can also put a comment. When was the first Haggadah uh, written? When was the first Haggadah? You know, it, go ahead, Rabbi, you're the Haggadah expert. I, I don't know the exact answer to that question. I know that they, they believe that the first printed Haggadah was, was in Spain around the time of the, uh, of the Inquisition, so in the late 15th century uh, in Spain. But I, I, obviously, the words of the Haggadah are included in, in the Mishnah. Um, allusions that I got are found in Midrashim, which are much, much earlier. So I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. Like I don't have been used for, for quite a long time, but I know it's for Haggadah collectors, late 15th century begins the, the era of the printed Haggadah. Okay, I have a question. Hi, Susan. Yeah. I always have a question. What you were saying, Rachel, Ibn Rabba, is this where Leonard Cohen got the name of his song, Hallelujah? <laughs> Was it from sitting at his parents' table <laughs> at Passover every year, and out came this word, hallelujah. I could, David, do you think maybe? He doesn't I think well. your guess is as good as ours. Yeah. There are probably yeah. Leonard Cohen scholars out there who, who have more educated guesses. But yeah, uh, maybe. But maybe. let's remember that this, this phrase, hallelujah, and these paragraphs that we're reading originate yeah. Uh, from the Psalms, right, from parts of Tanakh. So um, yes. I was even going to say that's another way to answer the Haggadah question, you know, where does the Haggadah come from? I mean, we're reading, we're reading bits of Torah, it, it's that ancient. Um, but uh, I can't say whether he got it at his parents' Seder table or by hearing our choir uh, and our services in the synagogue on a Hallel, you know, morning. That's true. That's true. He was in synagogue for mm -hmm. sure with his parents. Right. And he was also at home at Passover Seders for sure with his parents. That much I can tell you for sure. So I'm seeing a, so, another question in the chat. Thank, sorry, possible. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no. I think it's, it's a great question. Yeah, excellent. A question that Michael asked, are there is, uh, are there any thoughts as many of us gather beyond our immediate households for a larger in-person Seder for the first time in several years? That's a great, a great point that our, our routines have changed. And now in, in many cases, they're changing back 
uh, at least uh, at least slightly. Any any thoughts, Rabbi? You wanna? I was thinking about um, the the ways that there's something very particular about community or about a communal ritual that many people do privately in their homes. And, um, and when you bring it out into the community, it can sometimes be a little bit of a cacophony, you know, well, my, my uh, family did always did this and my custom is that, um, but it's actually the exact reverse of what we had done during the pandemic, which was that we took rituals that were usually communal coming to synagogue of Rosh Hashanah, for example, and we brought them into our individual yeah. spaces, our yeah. personal spaces. And that challenged us as well. That challenged us to ask ourselves, you know, who am I as an individual in this context when I'm so used to relying on community? What would even look like to spend a Yom Kippur by myself, for example? Mm -hmm. And we made that leap. And I think um, it strengthened our personal space and perhaps almost put up walls, right? That we had to now overcome coming back into the communal space. So I think Michael, your point is really important because even before, in the before years, BC, right? Before COVID, um, we, uh, we, we struggled to make space for other people's customs. And I think everyone understands that uh, maybe you won't choose the same tune that I want to do here or so, something like that. But even more so now that we've really been cocooned, um, it's about making space for something else and, and maybe learning from what someone else can bring to the table. Absolutely. I, and I want to, uh, to close, Professor Calvin Kelman uh, uh, pointed out, I think something really beautiful, which is that as our, as everything has changed, so to in many cases has the person who is leading the Seder uh, changed. I would add, you know, for, for a variety, for many, many reasons. Um, and, uh, and that's just a new reality. And I think that's, that's uh, new, new challenges all, all around. And we'll put ourselves out there as a resource if anybody has any questions or, or would like to discuss with myself, with, with, with Rabah, with Yassi, with, with Cantor Zellermeyer, we're here as a resource for the members of our community. If you find yourself in the unique position of leading a Seder when you never have before, or would like some some extra insights or whatever it is, we're we're certainly here for you, and uh, and we'll note as well that a recording of this session will be sent out in our e newsletter on on Friday. So if people want to reference it or go back and review some of the lessons, we're certainly happy to uh, to share that uh, to share that with you. That will be made available to you, but thank you, uh, Professor. That's a, that's a, a really wonderful point. That in everything that's changed, let's not forget that the Passover seders have changed also and uh there may be new new voices heard uh around those around those tables thank and you and let's hope for this in person sometime i'm just seeing the comment in the yeah, chat missing the in-person treats so uh, absolutely like that to look forward lots to of look forward. Forward. that's what passover <laughs> teaches us also that even when we look back we're always looking forward at the same time so thank you all and uh hope to see everyone in person in shul very soon. Chag Sameach. Mm -hmm. Chag Sameach, everyone.